In this video, we're going to talk about T1 spaces. In particular, we'll start with the definition, and then we'll look at its relationship to T0 spaces and T2 spaces. By the way, T2 space is the same thing as a house door space. So uh, you should go check out the video that I made over house door spaces and the one I made over T0 spaces to be up to speed with what we're going to talk about in this video. So what's it mean for a topological space X, T to be a T1 space? By the way, X is just a set and T is a topology on that set. So we'll say that XT is a T1 space if for each pair of distinct points, X and Y, little x and little y, uh, in your set X, there should exist open sets U and V. So when I say open sets, I just mean that U and V are members of the topology such that we get the following picture. So what do I want you to notice from this picture here? Well, U is a neighborhood of X, V is a neighborhood of Y, but notice that Y is not in U and notice that X is not in V. So if we write that down, X should have a neighborhood that misses Y, and Y should have a neighborhood that misses V. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Y should have a neighborhood that misses X. Great. So what's the relationship between T0, T1, and T2? So what are we doing, maybe to, to hold on for just a second? This is like another concept of what it means to separate points in a topological space. So these different notions of how we can separate points and how we can use open sets to separate points. So again, how are we using open sets to describe what it means for points to be separated? So for T0, to backtrack a little bit, if you watched the video on T0 spaces, you remember, T0 meant that for each pair of distinct points, we only require that one of the points has a neighborhood that misses the other point. Now, in T1, what do you notice in the picture? For each pair of distinct points, now we require that each point has its own neighborhood that misses the other point. So I hope that you see the difference between Z T0 to T1 there, right? T0, I just needed one of the points to have a neighborhood that misses the other. T1, I need each of the points to have their own neighborhood that misses the other point. What do you notice in my picture, though? I tried to emphasize it as well. We do not require that the neighborhoods are, dis are uh, disjoint from each other. So like you see that, look, there's some overlap between U and V there, but the point is X is not in V and Y is not in U. So what if we wanted to have a little bit more uh, of a stringent definition then? That's where T2 comes in, that's what Hausdorff is. So Hausdorff is kind of having more criteria. We're gonna tack some more criteria into T1 that says, look, you can separate your points in kind of the same way, but moreover, you could always find disjoint open sets that'll separate your two points. So again, I hope that having T0, T1, and T2 kind of laid out one, two, three right next to each other gives you an idea of how we're adding a little bit more criteria for what it means for points to be separated or, or a little bit more criteria in how we describe uh, how points are separated by open sets. And uh, one way you could think about this, or I've heard it described as before, is that like T0 is kind of saying, well, you've kind of got just enough points to uh, quote unquote, separate points from each other. T1 though, you're kind of requiring more open sets to separate points. And of course with T2, the fact that you could find distinct points or distinct neighborhoods that separate the points, you're even requiring more open sets uh, in your topology to separate your points. So what do we wanna look at here next? There are some logical implications. In particular, a T2 space is T1. So T2 implies T1 and T1 implies T0. So like any house door space is automatically T1 and T0. And uh, any T1 space is automatically T0. Always happens. So what we want to do is we want to show that if I try to reverse those arrows, you're not necessarily guaranteed that it's going to work. So in other words, like the reverse implications are not necessarily true. So we can't necessarily reverse these arrows. So let's look at uh, examples uh, for each one. So what if we tried to, you know, if you're thinking, is it always true that a T0 space is T1? And the answer to that is no. So what would be a counterexample? How can we show that a T0 space is not necessarily T1? Well, let's take the uh, Sierpinski space if you watch the T0 video. And what was it, just to remind you? X is just the set with two elements, zero and one. And the topology on X is gonna be the empty set, just the singleton zero, and the whole set itself. So notice in particular, right, it's almost the power set of X. I'm just missing in the topology. The only open set the topology is missing is just the singleton one, and that's important here. So in particular, right, XT, that space, is T zero. So like, as uh, in, in particular, if you look at the singleton zero, that's a neighborhood of zero, but it misses one. So I've separated the two points in the space. 
but it's not T1. And so why is it not T1? Remember for T1, we require that, well, the other point also should have its own neighborhood that misses the other point. So to say that a little bit less confusingly, this is bad because one does not have a neighborhood that misses zero. If you look at T, the only open set that contains one is the whole set X itself, right? So it's not possible for one to have a neighborhood that misses zero. So therefore, the Sierpinski space is not T1. The next thing we're going to look at, the last thing, is how come T1 does not necessarily imply Hausdorff, or T2, whatever you'd like to call it. And so in this case, let's let X be the real line, and let's let the topology be the finite complement topology. If you've never heard of this before, what is it? So the open sets are the following. One, the empty set, is going to be defined as open, and the other types of open sets are those whose complement is finite. And what do I mean by that? Let me give you a little example. If you think about the interval from minus infinity to zero, union zero to infinity, that is an open set. That would be an element of this topology because the complement of that interval is the point that it missed. It's zero. And so I'm just saying if the complement just contains a finite number of points, in my case, the complement just has one point here, uh, then that's going to be an open set here. So think about you've got intervals, but maybe you're plucking points out of them. What you're left with would be an open set. So this space is T1. So X with the finite complement topology is a T1 space. And let's just talk about why. So for any two distinct points or two numbers, let's call them that since they're real numbers, X and Y, uh, what can we do? We could draw this little picture. Can we build a neighborhood around X and can we build a neighborhood around Y so that the neighborhood around X misses Y and the neighborhood around Y misses X? And the answer is sure. Why don't we let X be in the neighborhood from minus infinity to Y, union Y to infinity, so that's my yellow interval. And let's let uh, Y be in the neighborhood from minus infinity to X, union X to infinity. So both of those colored sets there are open because their complements only have one element in them, therefore their complements are finite. And uh, well, what do you notice? Uh, we'll notice that uh, X is in the yellow set, but Y is not. That's great. And that uh, Y is in the pink set, but X is not. And so again, we found some neighborhoods that miss the other point. So that's the requirement for being T1 there. So since we could do that with any points X, Y in the space, good. We're good to go that X, T is T1. Now, why is it not Hausdorff? So why is XT not a T2 space? Well, any two non-empty non open sets uh, in this finite complement topology, they can't be disjoint. So the finite complement topology is kind of it's kind of goofy in that sense, in that uh, um, any two non-empty open sets have to intersect in some way, which maybe isn't too hard to believe. So how would we see this? Maybe you can kind of visualize it, but uh, how I think about it, you know, if U and V are two sets in the finite complement topology, well, that means that the complement of U has a finite number of numbers in it. So U1 through UN, where well, those are just real numbers, right? You could list out what are the points that are not in U. Similarly, the complement of V has a finite, uh, a finite number of numbers. That sounds kind of goofy to say. X minus V can, is a finite list. So say V1 through VM. So what am I going to do? Well, I know that there's a lot more real numbers than just N plus N of them. I'm just going to pick a real number Y that's not in either of these two lists. So let's let Y be a real number such that Y is not in the list of the U's and the V's. Well, then in particular, what does that mean? Well, that means that Y has to be in U and Y has to be in V. So what we've just shown is that there's a real number in the intersection of U and V. So what does that show one more time? R with the finite complement topology, it is possible to separate your points in the T1 notion, right? But you can't guarantee that there are disjoint neighborhoods that separate your points, and so it's not a Hausdorff space.